And speaking of L.A., the Lakers didn't win their seventh game of the season until the turn of the year last season. This season, they've already won seven games and we're only midway through November. Progress. The Lakers have now won six of their last eight and are two games over 500. Max Kellerman. Yeah. Is it time to take the Lake Show seriously? Yes, the baby Lakers <laughs> are for real. Now, in the NBA, what's been shown in recent years is after, I believe, it's 22 games. We know the playoff seeding already. Like, look at the records after 22 games. That's what the playoff seeding is going to be. Uh, right now, they are, what, 12 games in, 10 games in? But, and, and so there's a little time still for the Lakers. Let's see, let's see what happens. However, when you look at the standings and who's, you know, the, the, right now they're ahead of the Thunder. That should not continue. But you tell me the team that's for sure going to be the eighth seed over the Lakers in the West, the Grizzlies, the Kings, the Nuggets, the T-Wolves, the Suns, the Mavericks, the Pelicans. There's no sure thing in there. Uh, Luke Walton has turned Julius Randle from a guy who looked like a bust to boom. He has Nick Young playing defense. Think about that for a second. Nick Young is playing consistent defense. D'Angelo Russell looks terrific much of the time, as does Clarkson. And, I mean, they have a – and, by the way, this is without their number two draft pick really strong enough yet to assert himself in the NBA. The Lakers' future looks bright. But their present ain't bad either. They could make the playoffs in the West. I can't believe I'm saying this. They could do it this year. A few things I wanted to point out. <clears throat> Number one, Julius Randle didn't look like a bust. His first year, he never played because he got injured the very first game. Last year, he came back. That was the Kobe era. So this is really, as far as I'm concerned, his first year. He's never looked like a bust. Nick Young, a.k.a. Swaggy P. <laughs> but when you get yourself dimed out, caught in a certain situations, and your heart gets a little broke, you kind of tend to prioritize. So he's not as distracted, per se, this year as he may have been in years past. That's something we have to take into consideration. That may have been facilitating his growth as a player on both ends of the floor. I'll tell you where it will shock you and, and it, it stop the presses right here. I alluded to this weeks ago, and I will say it again. First of all, I will be at the Lakers Spurs Friday night. Uh, I'll be interested big to see that game. Them. It's going to be a big test for them, no doubt about it. I want to sit there, and I promise I was going to lay off Jim Buss. I've been very nice to that man, mm -hmm. all right, since, over, since this season, because I'm fond of his hiring of Luke Walton. I am a fan of Luke Walton. I think this guy is going to be, I think this guy is a golden boy, and I think he's going to prove to be an exceptional coach in this game. I, re I really like Luke Walton, and I love his daddy, so that don't help. Bill Walton, who doesn't love Bill Walton? But here's he's the, the deal. Best. He's the best, but here's the deal. Luke Walton does have a 29th ranked defense who's second to last in field goal percentage allowed, or third worst, or rather, second to last in field goal percentage allowed, three-point shooting, rather, allowed, and what have you. we got to pay attention to that. Five of the next six games are going to tell me what I need to know about the Los Angeles Lakers, albeit this early. It's because 82-game schedule. You got the Spurs. You got the Bulls. You got two games. You got Oklahoma City. You got two games against the Golden State Warriors, who you shellacked by 20. They will remember this. And keep in mind that this is the same Lakers squad that just got blown out by Minnesota and gave up 47 to Andrew Wiggins. So let's not forget that here. We like what we're seeing from the Lakers, but it's essentially a byproduct based off of what we've seen from them the last two years, which was horrendous. So because of that, Anything they give us that's relatively decent is something we're going to be happy about. That's what we're looking at right You're now. You're right. The next half dozen games, we'll see what they're made of. They, they started the season. I mean, like, oh, they've already beaten the Warriors this year. That's what I There's some quality wins. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Quality that losses. was the second back-to-back. -back. Remember they, the Warriors played the night sure. before? Still the Warriors. Oklahoma City. I'm just Still saying. The Warriors. Second they night. beat the Hawks. Right. They beat the Rockets. That's eight right. Two teams, six and four teams. That's right. I mean, they have some quality wins. Yeah. Even in their losses, they have usually been competitive and decided in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. The Lakers have come a long way. Now, the T-Wolves on paper look more talented, sure. But I, I, I want to talk about Julius Randle for a second. He said he never looked like a bust. I think he did. Not in terms of his skills. You could see he had skills. He could handle the ball for a big-ish guy, etc. But the way he was applying his skills made me wonder watching him, last year especially, because he was hurt the year before, made me wonder, is he actually going to be Hold on. a good NBA player or is he going to be a player who looks good and puts yeah, up yeah, numbers yeah, but doesn't help you win? Yeah, but I'm, he is a good NBA player. But I'm saying what you're wondering about 
you can't ignore the fact that he was coming off an injury. And because he was coming off that injury, they say it takes a year or so. So he may have been playing the way that he was playing to compensate for whatever he was physically Maybe, felt, guys, however he physically felt he was they, lacking because he was coming off that injury. But also keep in mind, we have to wait and see because, again, this schedule that you've got coming up. If Luke Walton, you know what me tell you what Luke Walton deserved the biggest credit for? Jordan Clarkson and Louis Williams off the bench. Because you got yeah, the second plugs. unit's as good as I'm their just, first unit. I'm just saying, you, you got guys yeah. coming off the bench with firepower. That, to me, getting Swaggy P in the starting lineup, but getting them coming off the bench is big. Randall, by the way, just because you can dribble doesn't mean you always should. Now he's with taking that. it off the glass, pushing it, and getting rid of the ball. I'm a fan Luke of Randall. Bolton has them playing I'm well, a fan, I'm a fan of Randall. Randall can play. First Take is brought to you by Audi and the 499 DQ Chicken Strip Basket at participating locations. Oh, Phil Jackson, he's never been shy around a microphone. And he had some words that LeBron James found very offensive and inaccurate. The Zen master characterized James' business associates as a posse in a recent interview with our Jackie McMullen. Here's the quote from Phil. <clears throat> it had to hurt when they lost LeBron. That was definitely a slap in the face. But there were a lot of little things that came out of that. When LeBron was playing with the Heat, they went to Cleveland, and he wanted to spend the night. They don't do overnights. Teams just don't. So now Spolstra has to text Riley and say, what do I do in this situation? And Pat, who has Iron Fist rules, answers, you are on the plane. You are with this team. You can't hold up the whole team because you and your mom and your posse want to spend an extra night in Cleveland. LeBron, how do you feel about Phil's comments? To so use that label, and if you go and read the definition of what the word posse is, it's, uh, it's, it's not what I've built over my career. It's not what I stand for. It's not what my family stands for. And uh, I believe the only reason he used that word was to see young African Americans trying to make a difference. We see the success that we had, but then there, then there is always someone that uh, lets you know how still, how far we still have to go as African Americans. You know, and um, I just don't believe that Phil Jackson would have used that same term if um, he was doing business with someone else. Um, you know, in in. Uh, you know, working with another team or if he was uh, working with anybody in sports that was owning the team that wasn't African-American and they had a group of guys around him that he didn't agree with what they did. I don't think he would have called him a posse. I had nothing but respect for him as a coach for what he was able to do, obviously, at the helm of one of, the, of my favorite player of all time, MJ, and also been there growing up and watching with the Lakers. But uh, I got nothing for him. You said you had respect for him until... Yeah. Yeah. Stephen A., talk to me. First of all, LeBron James is 1,000% correct. Uh, he said he had respect for Phil Jackson. Evidently, he's lost it. Phil Jackson deserves a diminished level of respect this morning. Let's be clear. Phil Jackson is not a racist. Let's get that out the way. Uh, MJ would attest to that. Kobe Bryant would attest to that. Shaquille O'Neal would attest to that, et cetera, et cetera. He's no bigot. He's as progressive as they come. But Phil Jackson needs to appreciate the fact that at least when the word bigotry comes up, he did come across as a bit that way. Because we saw our president-elect, whether it was at a restaurant or wherever he was, with a bunch of people the other day, they weren't called the posse. I certainly haven't heard Phil Jackson alluding uh, to anybody, uh, any white ball players as having a posse. Uh, when he, uh, when Rachel Nichols, he did an exceptional job of highlighting and articulating on Twitter what Phil had written in his book. Amen. He alluded to, he alluded to what he thought LeBron was, but he also said, we shall see. Well, what have we seen since Phil wrote that book? We've seen LeBron captured three championships. We've seen him go to three consecutive NBA finals. We see himself in peak condition. We see him going out there despite being the richest player in the NBA, playing like he's broke. We see a 31-year-old individual who has rebuilt downtown Cleveland, not once, but twice, whose philanthropy can't be questioned, who's facilitating thousands of kids receiving an education and beyond because of the millions upon millions of dollars he, through his foundation, have poured into those efforts. This man is the quintessential iconic sports role model that we have seen maybe ever. And for Phil Jackson to talk about him and a crew of individuals the way that they do, I take offense to that. Let me be very, very clear. 
LeBron is another player to me, as great as he is. In terms of personal relationships, I'm tight with many, many other players, more so than I am with LeBron James. But I respect the hell out of him as a man, as a brother, as an athlete, as a superstar. And the profound respect that I have for him is equal to that that I have of his boys. I know Rich Paul. I know Mark Maverick Carter. I know his boy Randy. Good brothers who work their tails off, who take offense to this kind of label because they understood the importance at a very, very early period that you can't be about being a hanger on. LeBron James ain't about that. He wants to give you an opportunity, but it's up to you to kick the door down and to elevate yourself to another level. They have done that in their respective chosen fields. They should be commended for it. And for Phil, Max, to allude to that, to them in that way, was highly, highly disrespectful, especially since it's nothing that he's ever said about MJ. It's nothing that he ever said about Kobe. Why on earth would you try to say it about LeBron James? I don't blame LeBron James for being offended. Um, neither do I, but I'm going to defend Phil Jackson a little bit here. And I realize when a white dude on TV defends the white coach who says something racially insensitive about the black player, it can easily be perceived as, oh, of course, because, you know, if you didn't live through the struggle, or if you don't live through the struggle, you don't identify with it, and you're going to try to brush it off as not a big deal. I think that these things become big deals partly because it's baked into the system. So LeBron James uses this moment as a teaching moment. I thought it was really well done by LeBron James because people should be aware that sometimes the language they use, particularly groups that have not been, you know, persecuted groups, uh, and Phil Jackson belongs to one of those groups, uh, they should be aware that the language they use sometimes reflects, even if it's unconscious bias or unconscious uh, feelings that they would be better off without. It does reflect that at times, and LeBron James used the moment to point it out. But we're here, and, and the sports media is here, selling you know the products we sell during the commercials. And if we think that an issue can get people to watch, we will exploit that issue. And on Twitter, it'll be clickbait, et cetera. So a, a good teaching moment that LeBron is using here with Phil Jackson turns Phil Jackson into a villain out of proportion with the actual crime he committed. What was that crime? Lazy thinking, I think, is really the crime that Phil Jackson committed here. Um, not just maybe using the word posse to describe a young African-American, especially successful African-Americans in this case, uh, because, you know, in boxing we call it an entourage, and that's generalizing. We know that entourages frequently are filled with hangers-on. You pointed out very well, I think, why that's not the case with LeBron, because LeBron gives his, you know, people an opportunity but then they have to make the most of it. So the people you see around LeBron have been selected out. It's like an evolutionary process. Either you contribute or you're not there. But how else is it lazy? I want to mention this because it relates to that idea. Maverick Carter in particular, I want to point out, is an extraordinary person. It's what are the odds that someone who played on the same high school basketball team as LeBron would be given the chance and then becomes a mogul in his own right. And then doesn't just take the opportunity and does okay, but does exponentially better than anyone could have imagined. That not only is LeBron a one in a billion guy, but he surrounds him, but the guy he played on the same team with is a one in a million guy. So it's, it's general and lazy in that point of, from that point of view of Phil, to use the word posse, but to apply it to the people around LeBron, particularly Maverick Carter, is in a way it points out how extraordinary Maverick Carter is because in, 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 Le, in Phil Jackson's experience, the entourage, or posse as he calls it, around players in a predominantly African-American league has been to entitle those players in a way that he feels is counterproductive. And I think that's legitimate. It's just lazy to apply it to LeBron. With all due respect, I think you're letting Phil Jackson off the hook. Now, you are as sensitive and as decent as they come. In no way am I questioning you in terms of how heartfelt you feel and how sincere you are, particularly to a myriad of causes that affect the African-American community. I want to say that. But if I'm correct, you are Jewish, right? Correct. Uh, Max Kellerman, does a black person or a white person get to define what is offensive to you as a Jewish person? I don't think anyone gets to define what's def offensive to anyone else. No, what I'm saying to you is that as a Jewish person, if somebody says something that you deem anti-Semitic, 
It's not for me to question that. It's for me to be informed by someone who is Jewish, enlightened, sure. and then as a result, I'm able to say, okay, you would know I wouldn't because I'm not Jewish. I'm saying here, LeBron James is the black man, okay? He is the one that stands and is standing front and center feeling the words that Phil Jackson said. Now, you got to understand something, Max Kellerman, because it's very, very important here. Black folks in America, let's be very, very clear. On many, many occasions, we feel undervalued, mm -hmm. underestimated, marginalized. My man Joe Madison was talking about that this morning on Sirius XM on Urban View. Those are three things that black folks not only feel consistently, but religiously and methodically go about their lives of working against. I am saying to you, Max Kellerman, Phil Jackson, who has 11 championships, riding the coattails of Michael Jordan, let's call it what it is. Phil Jackson didn't invent the triangle. That was Tex Winter. He riding the coattails of Michael Jordan with Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman, riding the coattails of Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant, okay? Phil Jackson has 11 rings, all right? Because of African Americans, he coached, I ain't even bring up the ones he played with in New York City in 1973, the last time the Knicks won a championship. Okay, this man has been around enough black people. He has been sensitive enough to his credit to enough black causes. This man is well read. He's well informed. He knows better. So when you sit up there and say it was lazy, when it comes to reading, when it comes to experiencing, when it comes to enlightening and educating yourself about what people different than you may All feel, this, yep. Phil Jackson is not lazy, which means that if he wasn't lazy, he intentionally said that. I am not letting him off the hook on that. All that assumes not one that bit. he wouldn't have used the word posse with a white player yep. and his hangers-on, although in LeBron's case, they're not hangers-on. And that may be true. Difficult to prove, but I wouldn't argue against that too hard. Okay. That may be true. Which I is heard why, do it. Which is and why the crime here is insensitivity or okay. no. laziness and... Well, go ahead, go ahead. There's one other thing. He also misrepresented the story, and Rachel Nichols enlightened us on this, in that LeBron wanted to hang out a night. The game was Wednesday in Cleveland, and then Friday they're going to Toronto, and he made it seem like LeBron just said, hold up the plane, I want to hang out with my family and my posse, when he had invited the whole team over his house for Thanksgiving rather than spending this a grand holiday. Is, and, he Again, also wanted, and he also went a step further. Misrepresenting the narrative of this, what LeBron was trying to do, making also him went, look like a bad but guy. But he also right. went a step further because it implied that he was a prima donna athlete yeah, who expects special but treatment that, when by the way he knows that certain guys deserve it right but 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 that i think is actually a function of lebron not playing for phil jackson phil jackson's always done this to opponents he tries to undermine them in with statements in the press he's always done that in terms of the sensitivity as I said, LeBron has an absolute right to feel that way. He's, I think he's right about it. My own mm -hmm. judgment is he's right about it. And he used it as a teaching moment. Right. And I started by saying that was a good thing. Phil Jackson right now needs to come out and apologize to LeBron James. The NBA is better because of LeBron James. LeBron James has honored the NBA brand just as much, if not more, than Phil has. He should come out, man up, mm -hmm. and apologize to LeBron James right now. On Whether that note, or not LeBron wants one, by the way. Yeah. Right. On that note, can you guys head over to Twitter, weigh in here. Should Phil Jackson publicly apologize to LeBron and company? We'll share those results a little later in the show. We want to hear your thoughts on that. But coming up next...